church family, thanks for being with us today. We're gonna continue in our message series called When in Rome, where we're talking about the book of Romans. This past week, we were in chapter eight. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, but that's okay. We wanted to come in and re-record this message just for continuity and really the content that many of you are following along with, maybe at home or in your personal study time. So what we're wanting to do is I'm gonna preach this just to you in your living room or at your desk, wherever you're at right now. We're gonna go through the chapter eight together. Uh, before we do, we talked about just a little bit with, with chapter seven, do a little quick recap. Um, chapter seven was pretty depressing. It's pretty, um, pretty, pretty rough chapter, meaning that, that the Apostle Paul describes um, that God's law exposes our sin, and also he shares his personal struggles with sin. And, and really, he, he goes back and describes this in chapter 7, verse 15. This is the most Dr. Seuss-sounding scripture I've ever heard in my entire life. The Bible says, I do not understand what I do. For what I do, I do not... For what I want to do, I, don't, I do not do, but what I hate to do. In other words, what he's saying is, I know what I need to be doing, I just... I don't do it, I mess up. And when I read that, that, that verse, uh, it, it actually encourages me because this gentleman wrote basically two-thirds of the New Testament and he struggled and he had things that, that he was working through in his own life. And, and then at the end of, of the chapter, he, he says this, just struggling, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? But then, then hope steps into the equation as we exit chapter seven and we enter chapter eight, and he says this, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in other, in other words, I know, I know who will rescue me. Yeah, this is the struggle that I'm in right now, but I am putting my hope, my faith, my trust in, in Jesus. Now, the best thing about chapter seven is this, <laughs> chapter eight follows it. And chapter eight is, is really described as the sparkle on the diamond on the ring. If, if one com Bible commentator said, if the, if the word of God was the golden band, the book of Romans would be the diamond. Chapter eight would be the sparkle. And this is what makes chapter eight so absolutely incredible, is the way it, it begins and the way that it ends. It begins with this, watch this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That's amazing, okay? Starts there and ends here in, in verse 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So look at the bookend of that. No, sep no separation, no condemnation, no separation. And, and that's, that's the, that is the, the, the chapter eight, the, the big, big idea. And I want you to know something. When he says no condemnation, um, he, he didn't say no failure or mistakes because Hey, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. We all, um, um, we all struggle sometimes. And even with the Holy Spirit's help, sometimes we override that still small voice and that nudge and that knowing, the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit's problem or fault. It's, it's absolutely ours, but sometimes we, we override that. And neither does the Bible said that there are therefore no consequences to those that are in Christ Jesus. And I think that that's where some people may make a mistake or totally misunderstand that, like it's no big deal. No, sin is a big deal, and, and sin harms, harms us, it harms those around us. And uh, there are, are temporary consequences to both those that are in Christ and those that, that do not know God. Um, there are consequences for our, our, our actions. There was a, a story, a joke that I heard that this, this minister was pulled over for speeding and, and the officer was about to write the ticket and the minister said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And the officer handed the, the minister the ticket and he said, go thou and sin no more. <laughs> oh, that hits so close to home for me, church family. Guys, listen, that we do have consequences, right? We have consequences for for our decisions. And just because we, we love Jesus doesn't mean that the consequences disappear. Well, chapter seven is inward focused. Paul is talking about his struggles, his, his issues that he's going through. Now, the, here's, the, here's the beauty between no condemnation and no separation. Um, previously, in, in the book of Romans, 
Paul uses this person, the name of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, the person of the Holy Spirit. But, but in, in chapter eight alone, he mentions the Holy Spirit, check it out, 20 times. So, so a self-focused gospel says, come to Jesus, he'll make your life better. A Jesus-focused gospel says this, come to Jesus, and what he's gonna do is he's gonna change you with the power and through the help of the Holy Spirit from the inside out. And so I, I read this quote from a while back um, about, and it really paints the picture of, of how Paul describes spirit living, spirit-filled living. And the quote was from a Bible commentator, an author, a theologian, uh, John Scott, a wonderful, powerful Englishman. And he says this, I love this, the Christian should resemble a fruit tree. Listen to that. A Christian should resemble a fruit tree, not a Christmas tree. For the gaudy decorations of a Christmas tree are only tied on. They're just hung on. Whereas fruit grows on a fruit tree. And think about that. I thought about that. I thought, man, no wonder, no wonder our attempt to, to try to overcome and our personal attempt under our own strength and trying to be patient, kind, or gentle it, it fails so easily because when, when, when things are hung on our life and decorated in our life, instead of us living the spirit-filled life, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, listen, when life shakes you, decorations fall off. But when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, that spirit-filled life, then the fruit comes from the inside out. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen. And he talks about spirit-filled living through this idea of being adopted. And through a Roman his history, Paul starts to describe what the adoption process looks like. And it's, it's, a, beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I, it hits home for very close to me and, and Sandra and our family because um, one of our awesome daughters is, is adopted. She's 100% she's ours. She just came home the long way. That's all. Just a different way home. And so it's just near to our heart. And we have a, a very real understanding of this concept of being, being a part of the family and you're coming home a different way. So in, in, the, Roman, in the Roman government, the Roman world, um, uh, the adopted child, um, if you were adopted, you were immediately, um, you would lose any privilege or any right, watch, and any debt of your previous family. And, and at, the, at the moment of adoption, you would receive all the rights and privileges of this new family. Isn't that amazing? That, that's our life in God. God adopted us. He engrafted us into his family. And all of the rights and privileges of heaven they are now ours. And this is the beautiful part as well. All of the debts are canceled. Isn't that amazing? Like all the debts that, watch, our sin debt, all the debts that our life incurred are totally wiped out. Why? Because we are part of the family of God. Paul says it like this in verse 14 of chapter 8 through 17. He says, for all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful of slaves. No, no, instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his very own child. It's not like a child. Now you are his very own child. And he goes on to say this, this term that I'm, I'm sure if you are, have been around church for a while, Christianity for a while, you've heard this term. Now we call him God, our Father, Abba, Father, make a note right there, underline that, highlight that. Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, the Bible says that we are his heirs. So, so Jesus modeled this wonderful prayer um, in, in, Matthew, in, in the book of Matthew when he says, our Father, you remember that? Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. So we, we, have, we have the same privileges as biological children. We've been engrafted into the family of God. So when Paul was talking to the Jew and the Gentile, 
it wasn't just Jew. It was, it was Jews that now believe. They're in the lineage of Abraham, but they believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And he goes, now, Gentiles, this is for you too, because you have also, this is a spiritual adoption. This isn't just a lineage of, 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 of man. You are adopted. Jew, Gentile, we are adopted into God's kingdom, not just a, a, a lineage on earth. And then he, then he kind of just he shifts this Abba Father idea. And this, very, this is very different than, than the Jews would pray before Jesus. The rabbis would never, ever teach their, their, their students to pray to God as Father. It was, it was a very formal prayer. Why? Because God was a very distant and remote God. He was God of the universe, never intimate, okay? Um, um, still today, still today, an Orthodox Jewish community refer to the Lord not as God, um, not even as Yahweh, but as this, ver this word right here. Write this down, Hashem. Hashem is Hebrew for the name, the name. So it's, it's for example, when speaking about God, Orthodox Jewish community will use the word Hashem. But when they're speaking to God, they will use this term. Write this down, Adonai. Adonai is Hebrew for my Lord. Uh, again, it's, there is uh, to, to, about God, Hashem, all right? To God, Adonai. But neither, one is the name, one is my Lord. But neither are intimate like a father. So let's get back to this term, Abba. Abba is an Aramaic term, and, and, and I know you've probably heard this with American pastors, preachers, that Abba simply means daddy. Well, I would say this, there is an intimacy to that word daddy, but um, that actually the word Abba has two elements about it. One is intimacy, and the other is obedience. So Abba is actually more in line with the English term, sir, rather than daddy. Okay, we, daddy is, you put the, put the kids on, on your lap, you bounce them around, you wrestle with them, and you know, dads, we wrestle with them in the, in the living room. And, and there, is a, there is a fatherly, a, a daddy um, a relationship there. There's intimacy there, there's closeness there. But the English term sir is more accurate, but it's not even that accurate because it's, 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 too, it's too pronged, all right? Since it's both intimacy and it's obedience, it's, it's this, it's not sir or daddy, it's both, it's this, write this down, Abba, father, it's father, but it's also obedience, father, I will obey. Think about that, father, there, there, sir, there is intimacy. We can say daddy, but it also is connected with, daddy, listen, I will obey you. Father, sir, I will obey. Now think about this in context, this is so beautiful, because the scripture, we're, we're, let, let, let the, every word be established by two or three witnesses. Jesus said this passionate plea in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that he was betrayed. He says, that the, the Bible paints this picture in Mark chapter 14. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and he prayed and, that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And this is Jesus. He said, Abba, Father. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. What is he saying? Abba, Abba, Father, Sir. I, in other words, I'm crying out to you for help. If there's any other way your plan of redemption for mankind can happen, let it be, let it be. But watch, here's the other side of, 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 of Abba. Father, but not my will, but yours. In other words, Father, I will obey you. I don't want, this is, this is difficult for me, but Lord, I'm holding on to you, and Lord, I want you to know that I will obey you. And so there's intimacy. He's drawing away from people to go pray. There's obedience, not my will, but yours. Okay, that's the New Testament example. Look, look back at the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac, all right? Check this out. Genesis chapter 22, this is so exciting. So Abraham placed the wood on the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked together, Isaac turned to his dad. He said, um, turned to Abraham, he said, Father, guess what that word is, Abba? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. 
Um, we have the fire and the wood, uh, but, but, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? I, I, see, I see the elements, but something's missing. Where, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? And this is what Abraham says. God will provide the sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and then he says this, and they both walked on together. Earlier in that chapter, it says that as they traveled, as they journeyed together, they left the servants down off the mountain as they went a little farther. Isn't that interesting? They, as they continued on, Je Jesus left some of the disciples, you know, a little further past, but you know what? He, he drew closer to God. So Abram said, look, I want the servants to stay here. Why? Because I want to take the, the intimate family members far, farther on. So you've got the, the, the intimacy of a family's, family travels on, and then you have the obedience. Dad, wh wh where's, where's the sacrifice? God will provide. Well, Father, Abba, Dad, I don't understand but I will continue walking with you. Oh, ch church, please, please get this. God, Father, I am wholly yours. I will continue this journey along with you. So ladies and gentlemen, when we surrendered our life to, to the Lord through Jesus Christ, we have now an Abba relationship. Before that, we had a Hashem, the name he was a God of the universe, but he was not the one that would sit down close beside me. So let's keep going. Romans chapter eight, verse 23. We too, we wait with eager hope for the day when God will, watch this, it hasn't happened yet, but it will, it will. What will he do? It, God will give us our full rights as his adopted children. Now watch this. Now, God's not holding out on us. He still has some rights that he has for us. He's not holding out, but, but he tells us what it is. Here are the full rights, including <laughs> our new bodies as he has promised. We were given this hope when we were saved. So we've got, we've got everything in life and godliness in Christ Jesus in this life. God has blessed us beyond measure, but there's still something else. What is it? It's that new body. We will get that resurrected body. Come on, when we pass or when it comes. Isn't that good news? That, 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 that blessing of, of that new body, that new glorified body. And I just wanna go on record and say, in heaven, you may or may not recognize me because I will have a full head of hair. Come on, everybody. You, you're, gonna have that, you're gonna have that resurrected body, that, that glorified body. And in heaven, we can have pizza for breakfast and lunch and still accidentally have a six pack, just like every 16 year old male walking around that we don't have to work as hard for our six pack, all right? But let me, let me do this. I wanna, I wanna wrap up the end of chapter eight with, with this beautiful story. This is, this is uh, to me, this maybe can answer some questions for you. For me, this has helped these verses I'm about to share with you after the video that we're gonna share in just a second. These verses have, have been a pillow for my head in the toughest hours of my life. Let me introduce you to an amazing woman of God, Corey Ten Boom. You may have heard of her. Um, Corey Ten Boom and her family led the Dutch underground during their Nazi occupation of Holland, and they aided and hid Jewish people in their home, a secret place, in a secret room in their home, which was above their watchmaker's shop. Um, unfortunately, she was captured. They were found out. She, was, she and her family members were captured and taken to concentration camps. But all the while, Corey held on to Jesus. All the while, she would talk about the Father and what Jesus has provided. Through Jesus' sacrifice, there was entrance and there was intimacy and there was obedience. Check this video out and we'll be right back with you to share these scriptures. I was five years old when I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. It was my mother who brought me to him. And the Lord accepted me as his child. I really have known now the Lord, now let's say 78 years, for I'm now 83, and when I was five years, I said my first really yes to Jesus. 
that yes is a very positive word. And that's what you must say if you have never done it before. And then the moment that you say that, he makes you a child of God. And you may say to God, Father, my Father. And he says to you, my child. How powerful is that? That we are the children of God. We've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, part of the family of God. Romans chapter eight, this is verse 28. You probably have this one underlined, highlighted in your Bible. This is what the Bible says. And we know, not we hope, not we think. This is Paul saying, hey guys, remember, we know God that causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose for them. That, 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 those, that, that two words, work together. Work together in the Greek is, is synergeo, synergeo, which means it's, it's, a, it's where we get our Latin word synergy. And, and God, this is gonna help somebody, I believe. God takes these things that are hurtful that life gives us sometimes and the things that are good and beautiful, and he synergizes them together for our good. How does he do that? I don't know. I just know that he does. I know that he's God. Write, write this statement down. Maybe this will help you in, in your faith walk. God, in his power and his providence, he synergizes the good things in life as well as Unfortunately, the bad things in life. Why? For the good of his children. Ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've pillowed my head on that verse right there. When I've got more questions than I've got answers, I say, God, you're working. <laughs> you're working. I, I know that you're working. And the first thing, the first thing that happens when when those things happen, those hard moments, hard seasons of life, is we'll do this. We'll begin to, to ask God, God, where are you? And then we'll question this, do you love me? We, we question his presence and his love. And Paul knew this. Paul knew this. And he, and he says, look, I'm going to ask a question and then I'm going to answer this because I know that the readers of this letter to the Church of Rome, they will ask this. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to nip this in the bud. He says this. He says, does it mean God no longer loves us if? And then he lists seven, seven things, seven stressors, seven things in life that will cause us to question God's love. Okay, does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecution or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And then he answers this, no, guys, no, remember, despite all of those things that I just listed you, we have overwhelming victory. It's, it's ours through Jesus Christ who loves us. Overwhelming victory. You, you know, one translation says that we're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. Do you know what that means? A conqueror has the ability and capacity to celebrate after a victory. But an overcomer, someone who's more than a conqueror, has the capacity, the ability, and the revelation that I can celebrate in the middle of the battle. Come on. That's good news. Right in the middle of the questions. God, where are you? I know you're here, but by faith, I, I know you're here by faith. I don't see you. I don't feel you. The, the goosebumps walked out of the hospital room. The goosebumps walked out when the crash of the economic season, whatever happened. But you know what? Because of the, watch this, this person that Paul's been talking about all throughout this chapter called the Holy Spirit. Now, for some crazy reason, I can laugh and I can worship my way through the questions. Why? Because I'm more than a conqueror. You know, all of our builders, we've got some 
home builders and commercial builders in our church, they, um, they love their customers, but the most frustrating customer is the one who comes in the middle of a project. <laughs> And what they'll do is they'll come in and they got drywall that's not done or they've got wires hanging up and they've got, it's just, it's a mess. It looks like just a bomb went off, like what in the world? And, and no contractor wants, no GC wants that customer there then because what in the world, what is this mess? And, and this is what every contractor wants to say and maybe they have. Listen, we're not finished yet. I'm not done yet. I haven't turned over the keys. It's not done. It's not finished. Come back when I tell you. Come back when it's finished. Maybe you're joining us with this video today. And as we've gone through the book of Rome, in your heart, you're like, man, my life looks like the drywall's on the floor. I got wires hanging down. It's so messy. This is not what I envisioned. This is not the blueprint that I thought. This is not the... This is not the Pinterest. This is not the Instagram. My life doesn't look like God's promise. And God would say to you today, I'm not finished. <laughs> I'm, I'm synergizing some things. All you see are the bad things, but I'm taking some great things and I'm working them out because when I give you back the keys, it'll be everything you hoped. Watch, and more, and more. Bible says this at the end of chapter eight. He reminds them, I'm convinced. I don't hope, I don't think, I am convinced. Because again, you're gonna question this. So don't. Because I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing. No, not one thing. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed at people who can walk through hardship and they hold on to God. It's beautiful. Why? How do they do that? Well, they can't lean on their own understanding and they, they can't lean on their own ability. At some point, at some point, they've got to surrender and they got to that point of God, I told you, you can have all of me, but God, I've got to have all of you. And they walk this life of faith. Here's a great, here's a great quote, quote I want to leave with you from the dear woman of God, Corey Ten Boom, that we watched earlier. She says this, hey, if you look at the world, you'll be, depre- you'll be distressed. And, and I can relate to that. I'm looking at the news and I'm looking at the landscape of our country and the world and it can, very, it can get your heart sick real quick. But then she says, when you look within, you'll be depressed. That's what That's what the Apostle Paul was struggling with in chapter seven. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? But then she says this, but if you look at God, if you lift up your eyes where your help comes from, if you look at God, you'll be at rest. I wanna encourage you today, look at God. Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter the finisher of our faith. I wanna pray for you before we leave. Aren't you glad that we have chapter eight of the book of Romans? No condemnation, no separation. What's in the middle? Power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. I thank you for every single person that joined us today, that's listening, and maybe their life looks like the project that's not quite done and they're thinking, this is not what I envisioned. What in the world? God, I pray that you would give them peace, quiet their heart. I pray that you would, this this time together that would remind them that, you know what, I'm gonna fix my eyes on Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that makes us more than conquerors. Therefore, we do have the capacity to celebrate right in the middle of the battle before we see the victory. God, thank you that you are strengthening us. You are bringing hope to us. Father, I thank you. No condemnation, no separation.
and only you can provide that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, we'll see you back next week at Highland Church.